Well, hello, Blue Ridge. I hope all is well with you and your family. This is our second week of not fellowshipping together, and I really miss it. I, I miss us coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ and praising and worshiping, singing songs and smiling and just having a great time in the Lord. I, I really do miss that. But I am reminded that that God is in charge. And nothing catches him off guard. As a matter of fact, he's the one that sent this uh, Corolla. He sent it for a reason. It might be something personal. It might be something to grab our attention. It might be something to remind us that he is God. And besides him, there is no other. I think we have lost that perspective here in America. America is so involved with self, so involved in doing our own thing. The only time we cry out to the Lord is during times like this. You remember uh, as uh, part of our history that every time the country grows, goes to some great calamity, uh, our leaders talk about a prayer vigil. Uh, leaders talk about the Lord. 9-11 is a perfect example of that. Churches were filled. People were acknowledging God and praising and praying to God. But as soon as all that blew over, we went back to our old selfish ways. And so God uses things like this to get our attention and I really believe if we do not heed God if we do not listen to his voice because he's trying to tell us that he loves us and he desires that we come back to him but I think the old pattern might come back again where when this thing dissipates and we go back to our own uh, regular life and doing our own thing again, we'll forget about God and go, in, go back and do the same things that we, we've always done. So I've asked in you, church, to stay faithful to God, to take this time in your life to get closer to Him, to draw closer to Him, knowing that He loves us. You know my theme scripture. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I like that word, whosoever. Remember, I said that whosoever means it doesn't really matter the color of your skin. It doesn't really matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter uh, what you have done, whether you have been, been locked up in prison or maybe on drugs or just a mean and hateful person, if you confess your sins and believe that Christ died for your sins and you asked him to come into your life, you shall be saved. God so loved the world. He loved everybody in the world that he was willing to give his son Jesus to die, to pay the price for our sins. He died that we might live. Let me put it this way once again. God became that which he had created in order to save that which he had created. So he loved us so much that he became that which he had created in order to save that which he had created. And so for us who have placed our faith in him, we trust in him, we know that we're going to heaven. But we also know that as long as we're here on earth, we're going to face trials and tribulations. And most of the time they come because of sin. We get caught up in that. You and I are not perfect, along with the rest of the world. And because of our imperfection, sometimes God has to remind us of who he is. He has to send uh, things our way evil things our way in order to grab our attention. That brings me up 
uh, to our lesson today. That's an interesting story over in 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm mainly going to deal with chapter 7, but I want to talk a little bit about chapter 6 just to give you some context. Let me read uh, the story over in chapter 6 of 2 Kings. I believe it starts at verse 24. We'll read part of it and let you know what is going on. Uh, and it says, And it happened after this that Benadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of, of silver. That's about, that's about two pounds, I believe. And one-fourth of a kina of dove's droppings was five shekels of silver. In other words, the famine was so bad that inflation really went up. People were hungry. People were starving. No one could come in and no one can come out of the city because Syria had blockaded the city. People were starving. That's another story uh, that the Lord put in this section to remind us how bad the situation was. Uh, the king walks out on the wall surveying the city. And a lady cries out to him for help. The king says, how can I help you? I can't help you. What can I do for you? And the lady says, tells him a story that is so frightful, so awful. And it shows you what people would do when they are starving, when they are hungry. She says that uh, she made a deal with another lady. The deal goes like this. I'm going to paraphrase it. She says that uh, we said to each other, uh, I would kill my son and we would eat him. And the next day you kill your son and we would eat him. And so she killed her son, boiled him, and they ate her son. They were starving. There was no food in the city. And she said the next day when she turned around to the other lady to make that to to for her to uh, bring forth her deal that they made, she hid her son. Now, this woman had killed her son, boiled him, cut him up, and they both ate him. She's without a son. Her partner in crime refused to kill her son. And when the king heard this, he cries out, tears his clothes off, and begins to call upon the Lord. He's angry, he's upset. And he threatens to kill the man of God, Elijah, because he blames him for all that has taken place. You know, sometimes when bad things happen, we tend to blame someone. Sometimes we blame God. We wonder why he allows these things to happen in our lives. We might not outwardly say, God, I'm blaming you, but inwardly because of the hurt and the pain, we might blame God. He's upset. He's mad. His people had uh, degenerated in such a way that they became cannibals. And I imagine this is not the only time that this has happened during this time. I imagine that there were other folks in the city because of a lack of food, because of a lack of water, because of disease that perhaps was running rampant throughout the city. I imagine there are others who have did the same thing. It shows you how low men will go when they are hungry, when their lives are, are ruined. Meanwhile, outside of the city there, the story is told that there were four leopards 
outside of the gates of Jerusalem of, of Samaria. The gates are shut. No one can come in. No one can come out. These are four leopards. Leopards are individuals who have some form of skin disease. They were considered unclean. They were considered outcasts. They were considered uh, almost as less than human. Uh, they were looked down upon. Uh, they were uh, segregated from uh, uh, the normal flow of individuals. Uh, when they came into the city, they had to cry out and let people know that they were coming. They had to cry out uh, and call and, and cry out and say, leopards are, are coming, leopards are coming in order for the people to move out of their way. And sometimes people will stone them to get them or to drive them away from the general population. They are locked outside of the city because they are leopards. They were not allowed to come within the city gates. The gates are shut. They are on the outside between the gates and the enemy. The enemy is behind and the gates are before, and they couldn't get in because the people would not let them in. They were starving to death. The scripture says that they said to themselves, uh, let us go to the Syrians, because if we stay here on the outside of the gates, we'll die. Uh, if we don't do anything, We'll die. Let us take a chance and go to the Syrians. Maybe they'll show us some mercy. Maybe they will, will spare our lives and, and give us some food. Or maybe they might just kill us. But it's better for us to die quickly than to starve to death. And so they, they made it upon themselves. They said within themselves, they agreed among one another that they will go to the Syrian camp and beg for food. They get to the outskirts of the camp where there are few people. I imagine as they are going, <clears throat> they notice that there was a perhaps a, a strange, eerie silence as they approach the camp. Because normally, a camp full of warriors, soldiers, will be quite noisy. But as they got to the outskirts of the camp, the scripture says, uh, they noticed that there was nobody there. And I imagine as they got in a little closer and looked around, they noticed that everybody was gone. All of the men, all of the soldiers had left. Only the animals, the donkeys, the sheep, the oxen were left. The tents were still erected. God had caused the Syrians to hear a, a great noise that night. And thinking that Israel had hired mercenaries, the Hittites and the Egyptians to come and rescue them, the Syrians thought that they were surrounded and they ran, left the camp, and left everything in the camp. Wow. These outcasts, these four uh, outcasts, these, these, these four leopard men found themselves in a camp that was loaded with food, loaded with silver and gold, loaded with, with all sorts of clothing, water, wine, rings, jewelry, gold. And the scripture says they did what anybody else would do. If I was there, I would have done the same thing. They went into one of the tents and they ate and they drank and they ate and they drank and then they got up and they began to haul off all of the silver and gold that they can possibly pay, carry out. They, haul, they hauled it out and hid it, buried it. They came back and went into another tent and did the same thing. They had struck pay dirt. These men, these, these men who were 
uh, considered unclean, considered an outcast by their own people. God used them uh, uh, to go into the camp and they found a treasure of food. They found a treasure of of gold and silver. And as they are hauling this stuff away, they came to themselves. They came to themselves, the scripture says. And they begin to reason that they were doing wrong. They understood that what they were doing was not right. That they were being blessed by God. And they needed to carry that blessing on to their fellow countrymen. It was a blessed day. It was a good day. It was a day of good news. And instead of them going back and telling everybody else, they were filling their own pockets, filling their own stomachs. And so they came to themselves and they said that we shouldn't do this. Because if we continue to do this, the next day the people will see us doing this and, and they will say, how come you didn't come tell us? And they will kill us. And so what we need to do is to stop what we're doing and go share the good news that salvation is at hand. Can I put it like that? Tell the people who are locked in the city that they have been delivered, that the Lord had been good to them that the Lord had delivered them. And so they went back and they shared that good news with the king's household. Now, what get me is this. These four shepherds, I mean, uh, 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 leopards, who were outcasts by their own people, Considered unclean by their own people. Forced to call out that they are leopards when they come into the presence of their own people. Went back to their own people who are locked in the gate in order to share good news. Oh, I'm going somewhere there. I don't know if you see that or not. They were blessed, and yet they went and shared their blessings, their good news, to a people who did not like them, to a people who considered them outcasts. Isn't that something? That was more than enough left for everybody. And they realized that that day was a day of rejoicing, that God had delivered them. And so they shared God's blessings with people who considered them outcasts, the people who considered them unclean. When's the last time you shared your blessings with someone? Are you hoarding? Are you hiding God's blessings? Are you hiding God's gift? Are you rejecting to give a blessing to someone because they're your enemies because they did something wrong to you because you don't like them. Remember what these four lepers said to themselves. If we don't share the good news, then there's a possibility that we can lose our own life. See, God didn't bless us for us not to be a blessing to someone else. And so doing this during this time when we are locked up in our own homes, uh, when uh, the disease or the, uh, is surrounding our neighborhood, when we are living in fear, we're scared to shake people's hands, and we are hoarding all of our food, hoarding all of our resources, uh, refusing to share, refusing to check on folks, refusing to say, uh, is there anything I can do to help you? Remember, that God is the one that, that gave us and blessed us with what, what we have. And so, church, I'm asking you. I'm asking you to share. 
Share your blessings. Share your love. Share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember once again, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you really believe that, if you understand what God has done for you, if you really can understand and remember how God has blessed you, where he has brought you from, where he has delivered you, how many times has God delivered you? How many times has God blessed you? How many times has God been patient with you? Then we can do the same for others who are in need. Someone has blessed you. Someone has delivered you. Someone has been a source of help and comfort to you. So, what are you doing? Are you running from tent to tent? Filling up your own pockets? Filling up your, your belly? Hiding or hoarding what God has blessed you with? Remember, as God has gave it to you, God can take it away from you. And so, as we look at this story, God is able to remove the enemy from before us. He's able to deliver us from impossible odds. He's able to give us a victory in the midst of uncertainty. And what gets me, I don't, you know, if you don't get nothing else, what gets me is this. God takes that which belongs to the enemy, that which belongs uh, to the unbeliever, and he takes it and gives it to his people as a blessing. In other words, that which belongs to the enemy, God will take it and give it to his people for a blessing. Not just for us to hold on, but for us to share that blessings with others. Whatever the enemy has, whatever the enemy will use against you, God can take that thing and reverse that thing and make us powerful, bless us, that the enemy, whatever the enemy has, whatever the enemy has that may seem greater to us, powerful to us, God can use it for our blessings. Has God ever taken something from the enemy and gave it to you? Has he ever made the enemy uh, your footstool? Has the enemy ever bowed down to you? Has the enemy ever acknowledged that the God that you serve is the true God? And so church, I want you to know, I want you to understand that whatever the enemy throws against you, whatever the enemy says to you, whatever the enemy uh, wishes to do to you, know that we serve a God that has the last words. We don't have to fight. We just stand still, keep our faith in God. And whatever the enemy has, God uses and gives it to us. These four leopards, outcast by their own people, Thought to be unclean by their own people. But yet God used these four unclean lepers to be a blessing to the people on the other side of the wall. God can use you no matter where you come from. You might be considered unclean to the outside world because of your past history. Because of what you have done. Because of the mistakes that you have made. I'm here to tell you. Through the word of God. The Bible says if we confess our sins. He is faithful. And just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter what you have done. No matter how heinous a crime you have committed, 
no matter what evil or wickedness you have committed in your life. God is able, through the blood of Jesus Christ, to forgive you of your sins. He's the only one that can, that can forgive and forget. He'll never bring your sins up again. And that's because you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Christ paid the price for our sins on the cross. He delivered us. We were locked up, quarantined from the love of God. But Jesus, God's son, came, died for our sins because of his love for us. And as a result, we are saved. And I'm one of those crazy preachers that believe once saved, always saved. He'll never take that gift away from you. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that's God's guarantee. His marker on each and every one of us who have received Christ. I dare say that's his identification marker. That doesn't mean that we won't sin. We won't make any mistakes but God is able to keep us when we can't keep ourselves and so church remember that you were saved to be a blessing to someone share the good news stop hoarding stop keeping it to yourself but share that good news with someone someone needs to know the love of God Someone needs to know about Jesus during this day and time. And I dare say that this perhaps would not be the last uh, uh, what uh, 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 disease that will come our way. Perhaps the next one will be greater than this. I don't know. All I know is that God is trying his best to get our attention. And so it's our responsibility as a church tell someone that deliverance can be uh, given, that you can be delivered from your sins through our faith and only our faith in Jesus Christ. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to pay for it. But we're saved because of God's grace and God's mercy. The only thing you have to do is to receive it in your heart. Believe it in your heart. Why don't you pray this prayer? It's a simple prayer. It might be someone who don't know Christ for the pardon of their sins. And if you would just bow your heads and say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins through the blood of Jesus. I receive Christ as my as my Savior. I've sinned, and I know I deserve death. For your scripture says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so I asked you to come into my life. I asked you to forgive me of my sins. I asked you to adopt me into your family. And I asked you to help me to grow in the grace and mercy. Teach me and guide me. Now that I am a part of your family, please help me to grow stronger each and every day. I ask this in the precious, powerful name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now that you are a member of the, the body of Christ through your faith in Jesus Christ, the growing process takes place. God will be there for you. I'm not saying and I'm not promising you that everything will be all right. I'm not saying that you won't have any more trials and tribulations. I'm simply saying that now that you're in the family, you have a father who loves you and will be there for you. And no matter what you're going through in life, know that he's there with you. We love you. And we're looking forward to seeing you soon. May God bless you and may God keep you. I love you.